Um, thank you. Please present item 7501. So good afternoon, Madam Chair and members. Richard Gillihan, I'm the Director of the Department of Human Resources. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today to uh, present some of our budget proposals. The first uh, issue before you has to do with the trailer bill proposal to clearly establish CalHR as the entity with uh, policy setting authority over the issue of additional appointments. As you may recall, this issue first came to light in early 2013. Um, and it generated a lot of discussion. We subsequently submitted two uh, statutorily required legislative reports to uh, the legislature in November of 2013 and a second one in November of 2014. And uh, uh, we've also issued various policy directives to essentially stop the practice of additional appointments without prior approval from CalHR. So there was some ambiguity in existing statute about who, what entity, whether it's CalHR or perhaps the State Personnel Board have authority for this and at the legislature's direction, we've uh, submitted this proposed trailer bill to establish clarity in that area. Okay, so the motion would be to approve the trailer bill language, right? Yeah. Are there any comments from the public on this? LAO, finance? Greg Cretol, Department of Finance. We have no concerns with this okay, proposal and support it. Thank you. Senator Anderson, do you want to move the trailer bill language? Senator Hancock? Hi. Senator Anderson? Aye. Senator Bell? That passes. And the second issue. So issue two, thank you. Um, has to do with ongoing policy guidance and compliance with the provisions of the Affordable Care Act. Um, this, the act, as you know, has dramatically changed the world of, of employee health care and uh, federal reporting requirements and the need to uh, maintain certain thresholds to prevent uh, federal penalties for lack of compliance. So this has been a, a significant new workload on CalHR. The proposal before you is, uh, in our view, a modest proposal for two permanent positions and a $426,000 in reimbursement authority um, to both fund those positions and also some additional consulting resources on the legal and actuarial side. Uh, it's important to note that there's uh, a lot of unknowns and uncertainties with the ACA at this point. The federal mm -hmm. guidelines and regulations continue to be developed. There are. Um, standards that we have to maintain to, uh, with respect to safe harbor the, and our ability to prove that we're providing coverage for our employees consistent with the act uh, to uh, keep us out of a, a situation of getting federal penalties. And there's a lot of work to do with departments as well to make sure we're capturing the right information both between us and the state controller's office and that we can provide that information to the IRS um, as well as provide policy guidance and direction to departments as new um, federal standards and, and related regulations come down. So we ask for your support of this proposal. Okay, thank you. LAO, finance? We have no concerns with the okay, proposal, any, thank you. Um, comments from the public? Am I right that this, when you say reimbursable, that means these positions will be reimbursed by the federal government? That's correct, Madam Chair. No, not by the federal government, by state agencies. So in, in our oh. health care program, we, um, we have a, a very small surcharge that for the administration of the programs. Mm -hmm. And so the funding actually comes to departments to pay us to provide these services. Okay, right. Um, thank you. So the recommendation will be approved as budgeted? Yes. So moved. Senator Hancock? Aye. Senator Anderson? Aye. Senator Bell? Okay, that passes. Um, issue three. Thank you again, Madam Chair. The third and final issue before you today uh, has to do with the program that we refer to as our delegation program. This was a, uh, when CalHR was created as a result of the consolidation of, of the former Department of Personnel Administration and the state person, the non-constitutional portions of the State Personnel Board. One of the uh, fundamental premises of the consolidation and the streamlining of the state's uh, human resources functions was to look at authority areas that we could move out from a control agency checkpoint and push those down to departments so that they could respond uh, more rapidly to their needs. And so as we developed our first wave of delegation, 
we had eight and a half limited term positions. Those positions are set to expire on uh, June 30th of this year. So this proposal is asking for us to um, maintain five of those eight and a half positions. So still taking a net reduction, but keeping a small cadre of staff in this function to perform ongoing oversight. So the, the functions we've delegated to date are um, what we call the career executive assignment program. That's where um, departments um, have some authority and flexibility with the salaries and the, sal and the levels of their CEAs that pre previously would have to come through us. Um, illegal appointments where uh, a person may have been uh, inappropriately appointed to a civil service position or promoted and to resolve those. And the third is um, exceptional allocations and that's where there are sort of guidelines at what levels positions should be at relative to the nature of the work and the number of people they supervise. So we've delegated those out. We're in our final, the, what we call our sixth wave of that right now. And at the end of that sixth wave, we'll be done. And we didn't just take this responsibility and give it to departments. We actually developed a very thoughtful and in-depth training program. Uh, and, and as departments come into the delegation process, there's a lot of coordination. We figure out their baseline, how many positions they have, you know, how they've been managing their positions to date. We require them to go through the training. It's a, it's mm -hmm. a requisite aspect of getting delegation. And then they actually sign, the, the department directors have to sign delegation agreements agreeing to comply with all the requirements of it. And one of those requirements is ongoing reporting of what you're doing under this delegation. And so as we move from uh, pushing the delegation of this wave out and we're gonna move more into an oversight role, we think it's important that we can oversee and keep an eye on uh, the departments to make sure that they're using this authority appropriately. And, and, and additionally, moving forward, looking for other areas that we can uh, appropriately delegate to departments. Can you tell me how many departments we're talking about? Um, I th approximately 150 departments. Okay. It's, 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 the, it's our full roster of uh, yeah. state agencies that you would yeah. think of. I, um, but I didn't know what that total amount might be. That's why I'm asking the question. Yeah. So it's about 150 agencies. Um, have you delegated to CDCR, for example? They're, they're the final department right now. They're, they're our wave okay. six because they're so large, they're a wave in and yeah. of themselves. Okay. And they're actually in the process of going through the training this month. So they're, um, and then we expect that they'll be the last ones to roll in by the end of the year. Okay. Okay. And um, do you think that you're going to need permanently five positions to do the oversight once you know that the systems have been kind of put in place? We do because we feel like we have an ongoing responsibility to maintain an oversight role. Mm -hmm. um, and this unit, CalHR, took a significant number of position reductions through the consolidation. And so uh, this particular unit that does this work is also responsible for a whole sort of suite of services they provide mm -hmm. to departments. So the workload's extraordinarily high. We've been managing a backlog up there since I arrived at CalHR. And, and we feel that delegation, the only way to pr responsibly approach delegation is to keep your eye on it. And mm -hmm. because if we don't and things go awry, we're going to end up back in this forum, perhaps explaining yeah. uh, what went wrong and what we, why we didn't keep our eye on it. So we, we think it's appropriate given our control agency role and, and our oversight of the state's human resources program. Okay. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments from the committee? Um, the recommendation is approve as budgeted. So moved. Senator Hancock? Aye. Senator Anderson? Aye. Senator Bell? Thank you okay. very much. Thank you. Now we have uh, an informational item on an update on the CalSTRS uh, Funding, I guess it would be implementation. <laughs> Good afternoon, Madam Chair Good and members. Afternoon. Member. Yeah. <laughs> My name is Robin Madsen and I'm the Chief Financial Officer for the California State Teachers Retirement System. I thank you for your approval of the recommendation on our BCPs. I also am here to thank you for the effort that you contributed to making re retirement security for California's educators more secure. So um, we are in the process of enacting the full funding plan that you passed as a part of AB 1469, Chapter 47 of 2014. 
Um, and we, we see this plan as fully funding the DB program over the next 32 years. I can tell you that implementation is proceeding. We are collecting additional contributions as due from the state, the employers, and the members, phased in over three years for the state and the members, and over seven years for the employers. Um, my areas of responsibility in the organization include the receipt of those contributions, so we are seeing the money coming in. So we, we are seeing that kind of contribution increase in our revenue streams. Um, the members who make higher contributions as required under the law are receiving a commensurate benefit for that in that they are guaranteed an augmentation to their retirement benefit at a 2% rate should they retire after January of 2014. So that's the commensurate benefit that they are receiving for their increases in comp uh, contributions. Um, we are seeing the rate changes applied appropriately between what we call our 2 at 60 and 2 at 62 programs. So the, the rate changes are different across those programs because the benefits are different. Um, within the program, the board also has limited rate setting authority should there be a difference in the actuarial status as presumed by the full funding legislation and what we actually see in reality. So if it becomes the case that either uh, uh, investment returns are exceeding or below expectations or there, there are census changes that impact the actuarial valuation. The legislation that you provided provides the board with that limited rate adjustment authority, which we appreciate. Um, we are prepared to report to you on a five-year basis in terms of our progress against the plan and the first report is due in 2019. We um, have not yet actually been through the implementation of a consequence of this in that given the way teachers work and accumulate service credit towards the end of each school year, they or certain members will accumulate more than one year of service by taking on extra assignments, extra periods, other kinds of duties. So as we approach the end of the school year, we have a cadre of teachers who end up with that excess service credit and we go through an annual settlement process where we determine for those members who have exceeded that one year of service, the balance of contributions that need to be transferred into our defined benefit supplemental program. So they only earn DB credit for that first year. That happens in August where we go through that uh, analysis and and transition of those uh, contributions. And with that, we will have received excess contributions for the portion that is moved to DBS because the contribution rates didn't change for that portion. So we've collected at the DB rates, but we'll need to return that. And so we are in the process of developing all of the technology needed to identify and return those contributions to the employers. And then the employers will be responsible for returning them to the membership. So That's we're... <laughs> Well, yeah. yes, that's yeah. the intention. And so we're working very hard to make sure that our reporting back to the employers via the county offices of education mm -hmm. as appropriate is clear in terms of the members where this has occurred. So not only will the monies be coming back, but also reporting to identify those members. I agree with you, um, <laughs> <laughs> Chairperson Hancock, yeah. that you know there, we are expecting that there may be some challenges with that and we are prepared to address that through appropriate communication, but it's certainly okay. something we're aware of and working on. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't want to, so in, in terms of those communication forums, we're really concentrating on our communication out to members and employers. We will be posting the information to the members as well as the associated employer for mm -hmm. whom, whom that refund has, has been returned or that return of contributions has gone, gone on their MyCalsters account so that they will have electronic visibility into that information as well. Okay. So again, n never, never, never done until it's done, but certainly right. the planning is in place to make that feasible. Um, even under this plan, the CalSTRS contribution rates for employers and the state are less than those that they experience under CalPERS with Social Security. So I think that's really important to recognize that even with the full funding plan that you put in play, place, the contribution rates are still less than those that they would be experiencing with employees who mm -hmm. are members of CalPERS and then their Social Security contribution. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's happened as a um, byproduct of this is, again, in my area of focus, I've been ap actively involved in implementing the new GASB standards um, that are applicable to pension plans. 
And with the full funding legislation, the proportion, the, the net pension liability that we have to allocate out to both the state and all of our employers is about, it's less than half of what it would have been without this full funding plan. So although employers are concerned about recognizing their share, their proportionate share of the net pension liability on their um, balance sheets and income statements, it's significantly less than it would have been without your help. So we see this plan going into place. We really thank you for your support and we look forward to its continual success. Thank you. Um, thanks very much. Any questions? Yeah, I don't have any. Okay, right well, thank now you either. For the, thank so you for thank the opportunity you, to and, yep, share this very information with you. Yeah, to hear how it is going. How it's going. So yeah. Thank you. Um, that concludes our business today. So, um, committee meeting is.